today uh, I'm going to uh, give a short talk on the topic of connected sociologies of pollution. And my name is Su Ming Koo, and I'm at the Ryan Institute and the School of Political Science and Sociology at NUI Galway. So my starting point today is, um, I'm going to go back to a historical starting point, uh, which is the UN Conference on the Human Environment in 1972, which was the first global connected uh, conference on governing the world's environment. And the opening speech that was given by the host of this conference, um, Olaf Palme, who was the Prime Minister of Sweden um, at the time, and this is an amazing speech, and one that I highly recommend anyone to listen to, go back into the archives and listen to, because very few world leaders have given uh, a speech like this about the world environment um, since this very uh, beginning. So at this point of time, then, he invited all the um, uh, state parties, to, uh, the United Nations uh, and uh, NGOs to uh, the conference in Stockholm. It was the first time he used and popularized this word, which had really only ever been used in the context of uh, war crimes. Uh, this was the, the, the word ecocide. And he made it pretty clear that it, he was referring to the chemical warfare that was being carried out by the United States military uh, in its uh, uh, war on Vietnam over a very long period of time from uh, the 1960s until the beginning of the 1970s. And he was very critical of the international community's disinclination to discuss um, these pollutants, chemical, biological, and nuclear pollutants in the context of war. So chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons. But he was also really uh, talking about the general need for international cooperation in peacetime in relation to the overuse of environmental resources, pollution, and uh, dumping of wastes as a threat to world peace. The need for cooperation was there because the atmosphere, the air we breathe, is not the property of any one nation. And there was a need for global assessment and monitoring of pollution. Um, so he noted that the international community still was not yet prepared to accept the full consequences of international solidarity. And this reminded me in thinking about uh, ecology, that even for uh, the well-known ecologists who write ecology textbooks, they note that the unanswered questions that matter for ecology are not in the ecology textbooks. They are ethical, economic, and political questions. And this question of the environment and environmental violence, the violence of climate change, this is really the most fundamental and challenging form of violence for humanity and the most fundamental of all challenges uh, in relation to global social justice. So this context that's given by this historical speech is one that acknowledges that we today still many decades after this conference on the human environment, live in a social and economic climate of absences, silences, denied knowledge, and unaccounted harm and costs. Now, there's been a kind of a, a dawning on the horizon, uh, because there's been a lot of interest and um, discussion in the last year or so uh, since 2021, of the uh, coming back to the forefront of this concept of ecocide, unlawful or wanton acts committed with the knowledge that there is substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment. But this, of course, as I tried to reflect on with my historical example, um, is a concept, ecocide, that emerged in the context of war times. So there's war in Vietnam by the US where uh, tens of thousands of cubic meters of 
chemical defoliants, herbicides collectively known as Agent Orange, were sprayed in this military operation that lasted 10 years over rural South Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, with the objective of destroying food and uh, fo foliage cover. And tens of thousands, 20,000 uh, uh, operations were flown in this 10-year period, dumping these uh, tens of thousands of cubic meters of chemicals on the land. Now, this was clearly prohibited uh, under the uh, laws of war. Uh, Article 8 of the Rome Statute prohibits intentionally uh, launching attacks where such attacks cause incidental loss of life or injury to civilians or damage to civilian objects. So damaging huge swathes of uh, land for producing food or uh, places where people live in their homes uh, is, is prohibited. But the wartime necessity qualifies this prohibition that widespread long-term and severe damage to the natural environment is prohibited where it is clearly excessive in relation to the military advantage, the direct concrete military advantage that is anticipated. So this wartime footing and wartime thinking around pollution has polluted our peacetime. In peacetime, uh, the idea of trade-offs, that you can do some pollution if there's a wider advantage, up to a certain threshold if it's not excessive. And the corporate drivers, why so many tens of thousands of litres, millions of litres of chemicals being dumped? Well, there was a huge corporate benefit in uh, the US military procuring these uh, uh, biocides, these uh, chemicals, from private corporations to use in the war. And so this trade-offs, trade thresholds, corporate influence, they persist in peacetime as forms of structural violence. So at the very same time that the, the, the Vietnam Agent Orange herbicide uh, attacks were taking place, um, peacetime economic exploitation of petroleum uh, uh, all different kinds of oil were taking place. And the illustration in the slide is of the uh, polluted forest in the area of the Lago Agrio oil field in Ecuador, one of the largest and most longstanding environmental uh, cases that's been taken uh, against a corporation Chevron Texaco, which was the main company of operating this area. And uh, uh, Chevron Texaco was sued by uh, around 30,000 Ecuadorian community members for to clean up this uh, mess. It's a very long-running case that has not been resolved. So this was going on in peacetime at the same time as the herbicide uh, bombing of Vietnam was taking place in the 1960s. And it's part of this historical legacy of global pollution that has been crossing borders and going from one place to the other, and the importance of corporate actors in thinking about you know, what is happening. Uh, because international laws relate to state parties, and international regulation of pollution relates to state parties. But if money is power, the majority of the most powerful entities in the world are not countries. 157 out of the world's 200 most economically powerful entities, richest entities, are corporations like Chevron Texaco, not governments. So these are some of the realities, I suppose, the wartime bleeding into peacetime that structures the inequalities, which are colonial inequalities, and how they impact on environmental harm and injustice and environmental racism. Why do I say environmental injustice and racism? Because environmental pollution moves across boundaries and transgresses borders, going from high cost and high wage areas to low cost and low wage areas. So pollution moves from the global north, which is a high cost and high wage region, to the global south, a low cost and low wage region. And this is 
basically due to what can be called the economic logic of pollution, which treats less industrialized, lower wage regions as, in the words of the former World Bank chief economist, vastly underpolluted. So what does this mean, this economic logic of pollution? This is where colonial um, theory and the need for decolonial decoloniality come in, because the logic of pollution is a part of a two-faced logic of colonialism, a logic of resource accumulation on one side and waste and pollution on the other. And the pollution scientist Max Liboron, um, in their book, Pollution is Colonialism, calls this bad relations. That's what colonialism is. Colonialism is bad relations that allows some amount of pollution to occur, and it's accompanying an entitlement to land to assimilate that pollution to occur at the same time. So the colonizing power sees land, labor, water, plants and animals, minerals, and finance as resources that flow to the global north, while waste, toxic effects, ill health is assimilated by capacities or sinks that are elsewhere or other bodies. These are the lower wage racialized peoples of the global south who are also then further victimized by being blamed for being the reason for environmental destruction, the pollution through their bad governance or their lack of knowledge or ignorance. So resource flows to the global north, assimilative capacity and toxins pollution flows to the global south. Of course, the south and north are not just geographical hemispheres. There is also a, a south within the north. So within the global north, you see that social movements for civil rights and against racism and against pollution started to mobilize together as environmental consciousness and civil rights consciousness began to grow together. And this was because within the global north, you saw the phenomenon of increased segregation where white people, privileged people were moving out of cities and away from polluted places to clean and healthy environments while poor indigenous black and minoritized people yeah, were stuck with polluted and bad quality environments and local activism grew to oppose health harming pollution and the lack of environmental goods because minoritized communities are more exposed to hazards and bads of pollution but had less access to environmental resources and goods like being able to uh, have pollution-free air and water, having access to nature, parks, and green spaces. So this was really experienced as racial discrimination in environmental policy making, in the way regulations and laws were enforced, in the deliberate targeting of communities of color. That's how they felt their experience to be, that they were deliberately targeted for the location of toxic and polluting facilities, waste disposal facilities. And this was a form of official sanction for life-threatening and health-harming poisons and pollutants to be located in black and minoritized and racialized communities. Um, along with a history of excluding people of color from leading and uh, uh, being at the forefront of environmental conservation and ecology movements. So this quote came from uh, a commission for racial justice, which, which was held um, to respond to the siting of toxic waste dumps in poor black neighborhoods uh, in North Carolina and the United States in the 1980s. So just to go a little bit back to this colonial logic of pollution. So Max Liberon, in their book Pollution is Colonialism, speaks of pollution as something that is not just the pollutants or the chemicals, but as something that is much broader. It is a logic. It is something infrastructural, extensive, a whole way of arranging a condition or the conditions of living. 
And these conditions are relations, bad relations, as I mentioned earlier, premised on white supremacist notions of property, what is ours, what is theirs. And this idea of you know, being entitled to pollute while stigmatizing and rendering disposable or as a site of further injury, any being or land that's already been harmed. So this kind of um, a Matthew effect of increasing inequality, if it's already been polluted, more pollution will be sent there. And it's not just, you know, the pollution and the relations, but all this economic and political and power infrastructure, the finances that enable harm corporations and the way that the pollution is regulated. And even when pollution is regulated, trying to fix it through regulation is still affirming this colonial settler state idea along with the corporate interests that came with settler colonialism. So how does this make us think when we try to account for this idea of fair shares of colonialism, of, of uh, pollution, and uh, given that there has been a history of colonialism? So some uh, very useful work has been done in relation to atmospheric pollution and excess carbon emissions by the economist Jason Hickel, who has tried to take a national fair shares approach to exceeding the planetary boundaries, but on a country by country basis. So taking in countries actual emissions and consumption um, and determining over pollution or as we might say under pollution according to a country's share of responsibility, you know, taking into account historical emissions, historical consumption, and uh, assigning responsibility accordingly. But of course, as I've said, with the environmental justice movement, there's also you know, the South within a North and inequality within countries as well as between countries. And this is something that we really struggle with in dealing with the colonial legacies and logic of pollution. Just briefly before I finish then, what kinds of pollution should we care about? Because I've just talked about Jason Hickel and uh, this national fair shares approach to carbon dioxide. And there's been a lot of spotlight on planetary boundaries in relation to uh, greenhouse gas emissions, especially carbon dioxide, but also um, uh, uh, CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, that affect the ozone layer. But there's been much less of a global conversation and uh, decolonial conversation around petrochemicals. So there's not really very much conversation about what are the planetary boundaries for chemical pollution which in the planetary boundaries literature is confusingly called novel entities. They're not really that novel. We've been uh, living with them for quite a long number of decades. Um, but this chemical pollution has now been, just very recently this year, been reported as exceeding planetary boundaries. Not because we know what the boundaries are, but because the amount that's being produced and released of chemical pollution annually far, is far outstripping our capacity to possibly monitor it at all. So if you think about how production has increased uh, between the 1950s and, the two, and 2010, global production of uh, chemical pollution increased 50-fold, and it's um, set to triple again uh, so 50-fold, 50-fold, and 50-fold by uh, 2050. And the number of different chemicals and mixtures, just the ones on the global market, there are hundreds of thousands of chemicals and mixtures of chemicals on the market. And this doesn't include uh, unintentional mixtures. And there are very few and rather limited controls. So we do have some controls on long range transboundary air pollution, mostly uh, the um, uh, pollutants that cause acid rain. There's the controls on ozone that are regulated by the Montreal Protocol. 
there is the Basel Convention on uh, on the moving of hazardous waste, and so the transboundary export or import of hazardous waste. There's a convention on monitoring persistent organic pollutants. These are the chemicals that were in the uh, organic pollutants used in the Vietnam War, uh, uh, Agent Orange, and, and all pesticides. But these fuel and limited controls are outstripped by the sheer quantity, number, and combinations of p chemical pollutants that exist already and are constantly being innovated and brought into existence. And the monitoring of these chemicals is only voluntary. It's been indefinitely delayed since uh, the beginning of the global pandemic in 2020, has a very small budget for monitoring, especially when we compare it to, you know, uh, what is being done for carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases with COP26 and the International Plan Panel on Climate Change. So what you see is regulatory regimes that have not only failed to prevent a crisis of pollution, but enabled it through the production of ignorance about pollution and acquiescence to corporate interests, even though these pollutants are really dangerous. So the global burden of disease estimates that occupational, so this on-the-job exposure to just 12 chemicals or types of chemicals contributed to more than 1 million untimely deaths in recent years, in, a recent, in each year. Uh, from pesticides alone, we have an estimate of uh, 200,000 deaths a year. That's roughly equivalent to the two bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They were detonated at the end of uh, World War II. Or they're also comparable to the number of deaths from all uh, results of climate change, the WHO estimates from all types of climate change, uh, 150,000 deaths a year in 2005 and 250,000 deaths a year in, uh, from 2030 to 2050. So they are about the same uh, uh, level, magnitude. Just to finish off this talk then, to come back to the overall um, emphasis in these series of lectures um, in Connected Sociologies. It's all about making connections and to connect critical and decolonial thinking in a way that makes a difference to what was originally thought. I really like this uh, formulation by Gurminder Bambra. And one of the connections that I wanted to make in this talk today is to try to speak back to and counter the depoliticized, unequal, and dehumanized accounts of the Anthropocene, which as if it is a scene of environmental destruction that doesn't have any people or that, you know, the people are all in the same boat somehow. Um, just to come back to this um, unprosecuted crime of war that took place between uh, 1961 and 1971, Operation Ranch Hand, with the release of huge amounts of dioxins, pesticides, herbicides um, onto the Vietnamese people and lands. Um, of course, it was not only the Vietnamese people who suffered contamination. Uh, the soldiers who fought in the war on both sides were highly exposed. And in, 19, in the 1984, uh, US veter veterans from the Vietnam War got a large settlement of $180 million out of court from 17 chemical companies. It was not until quite a few years later in the 2010s that veterans' compensation was given for uh, for a wide range of injuries and health harms and death, uh, but including uh, ones from uh, that were caused by the effects of herbicide release. And um, in 2012, then onwards, uh, three air bases that were contaminated from those air sorties in, in the 1960s uh, were finally be began to be cleaned up. 
but there has been no compensation for Vietnamese victims. And uh, the one of the spokespeople for the victims, who was a victim herself, who was in the Vietnamese, uh, in the Viet Cong army, Tran Tu Nga, she took a case against the same 17 companies uh, in France quite recently, but was not successful. Uh, and her remarks then, when uh, she was told the outcome of her case against the 17 companies, was that she wants the companies that produced Agent Orange uh, to have the courage to recognize their crimes and the courage to fix what they have caused because these are uh, corporations, these 17 corporations have benefited uh, to the tune of billions from the use and release of these harmful pollutants.